that's why I love this crowd because they're very respectful. And this is like they're so chat about this stuff. All right. Hey everybody. Thank you for coming to this interview session with Jeanette Epps. Uh, my name is Joelle Renstrom, and I'm a science and tech writer, uh, as well as a writing um, teacher at Boston University. And I'm a massive science fiction fan, and if I could redo my entire life, uh, I would absolutely want to be an astronaut. So I'm really excited to be able to ask Jeanette some questions. Um, I have many pages worth of questions uh, to ask her, but I know that you all will be thinking of questions that you want to ask as well. So the last probably 20 minutes or so, we'll, we'll turn to the crowd, both uh, in person and virtual, and folks can ask whatever questions they, they want to ask uh, Jeanette. So, hi Jeanette. Howdy, <laughs> nice to meet you, Joe. It's nice to meet you. So what is your official title or your role at NASA these days? So right now I am training for a mission. I was um, slated for the Boeing mission in August 2020. Um, I am a NASA astronaut and so um, I was slated to fly in space. So my main role um, now is to just train and fly in space. And you know, even though Boeing hasn't launched yet, um, who knows what will happen in the near future. Maybe I'll fly on a SpaceX, but um, we'll see what comes up in the next few months. Okay. So how long have you been with NASA? So I've been with NASA since August 2009, and um, I've had a really interesting career and with NASA. Um, I've trained for the Soyuz, Boeing, and now I've trained for SpaceX as well. All right, so I'm definitely gonna ask you about training for, for those different crafts and, and for those different companies, but I wanted to start earlier with uh, your childhood and when you realized you wanted to be an astronaut. I mean, was it when you were a kid or, or how did this happen? Well, it's kind of interesting because as a kid, I never thought that I would get selected to be an astronaut. But, you know, my, when my brother came home from university when I was around eight, nine-ish um, or so, um, and he looked at my report card and my twin sister's report cards, and he said, wow, you guys are doing well in math and science. Um, maybe you can become an aerospace engineer or maybe even an astronaut. And you got to realize this is around the time that Sally Ride and a whole bunch of women were selected to be astronauts. Um, and so as a kid, like I said, They'll never pick me to be an astronaut, but I can definitely become an aerospace engineer. And like I was telling the crowd earlier, I, I didn't even know what that was at that age. I just knew that I had to become an aerospace engineer. And it stuck with me. <laughs> so if your brother hadn't suggested that you pursue that path. I don't know what would have happened. I would have, I think, and I'm almost sure I would have ended up somewhere in science, mm -hmm. somewhere as an engineer or something like that. Um, he did plant that seed in my brain of specifically an aerospace engineer. And I think that's why I wanted to go to University of Maryland so badly was because it was one of the few um, schools that had a separate aerospace program from the mechanical engineering program. Ah. And I had a really big program there. Okay. So when you were younger, I, I'm going to ask you a lot about sci-fi, but I'm curious when you were younger if you read or watched any sci-fi or fantasy that might have had a, an influence on you as you grew up? Oh, oh, definitely. <laughs> um, so as a kid, you know, my twin sister and I, we were very, very overprotective. We were the youngest of seven. And so we spent a lot of time watching public television. And that was one of the only places where you could watch Doctor Who. And I was a huge fan of Tom Baker as a kid, and um, huge fan, <laughs> exactly. And um, he was my favorite, um, even though you know some of the newer ones are okay. <laughs> but he, he, he was the first that um, I, I got a chance to see and watching stuff like that. And you know anything that had to do with science fiction, I was I was eager to watch, especially like you know there was Nova on television. There were all kind of other things, but also you know one of my favorite m movies is um, Dune. Yep. So Dune was a, is a, I'm a big fan of the one with Kyle MacLachlan now. Um, and so I'm a big fan of Dune. And so everything science fiction, um, like I told you earlier, I, I love The Expanse. It's one of my favorite. Um, of course, we watched Star Trek. 
Star Trek was probably one of the few places that you, you know, the ideas of this um, directive and one world and everyone's working together and producing something, exploring the universe together. Um, and I think as a kid, that really attracted me. And I, you know, people, I do have a lot of people ask me, you know, as a little girl, did you think that it was for you, um, that you could do this? Or, I mean, when you watch Star Trek, you think everything's possible. And so um, that's probably one of the first places where I realized, I'm like, of course, I'm, you know, we can become aerospace engineers, molecular. My twin sister, um, she was a molecular cell biologist. And so I was like, of course, you know, there's not, nothing excluded um, for us. So we just assumed and we just kind of like, oh yeah, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So we were weird kids, but we were. <laughs> I think science fiction had the effect on you that is ideally the effect we want it to have on everybody, which is that there isn't, this is not impossible for anyone or, you know. You put the work and time in and mm -hmm. if it's your passion, it, yeah, it'll come to pass. Nice. Um, when you were young, did you have any, uh, like was Sally Ride kind of a real world inspiration? Were there, were there certain figures that you sort of held up and really revered? Oh, there were, there were many. Um, you know, just the regular people that everyone um, thinks of. Um, Sally Ride, of course, was one because these were the first women. Yep. Um, you know, it's kind of weird. My mom was a huge influence because she was um, probably mine and my sister's biggest cheerleader and supportive. Um, but, you know, thinking about Einstein and all the scientists that we read about as kids and different things that we saw, they, I mean, there were a lot of people that influenced, but the real influence was having that support to move forward because it's really hard. And just, you know, I, I, we used to look at people like Einstein and all these other people and say, wow, you know, how can we do that? How can we be that successful? But having a supportive family that tells you that, hey, you can be successful if you do this. You know, there's, there's not much, you know, this guy is huge and great, but if you want to kind of follow in his footsteps, you just have to do the work. And so for us, it was really about how do we complete the task and get to that point and then look to those people and try to follow in their footsteps. <laughs> um, so you mentioned going to the University of Maryland, right, for aerospace engineering. Um, I'm curious if there was any point during your educational trajectory where you were like, uh, maybe I don't want to do this or maybe I want to I don't know, be an abstract painter? Or did you have doubts? Did anything happen to make you really wonder what you were of doing? Of course, <laughs> of course. I mean, I think if you don't have self-doubt, you're, um, you're not human <laughs> to a certain extent. Yep. It's normal, I think. And um, I think, especially when you hit a wall and you feel like, oh my God, this is overwhelming. I don't know how I'm gonna learn this. Um, so learning all these different things like quantum mechanics, analytical mechanics, um, you know, just everything, um, structural dynamics, helicopter dynamics. It's very difficult when you first look at it and it's very daunting. But this is where, you know, my mom would come in and she's like, well, you just gotta put the time in and learn the concepts. And you know, of course it's hard now because you don't know it. But as you learn things, it becomes easier and easier and you become more comfortable with the information. If it's your passion, you're gonna do it. And so of course there was a lot of self-doubt along the way. I mean, especially right before doing things like having to do your orals. Holy cow. And you, you kind of rethink your life a little bit before you go in there. And then, and then you go in and everything's okay and life is good again. So I think, I think um, especially when it's something hard like that. And, you know, my parents weren't engineers or scientists. So it was, it was definitely, there were definitely times when there was self-doubt and figuring a way out of that is always the trick. Mm -hmm. But having a family that supports you, having friends, um, understanding what is actually really happening, like this is actually hard. <laughs> it's not just you, it is actually hard. And how do you get to the point where it's not hard anymore? So, yeah. Um, I read in your bio that you were in the CIA for quite some time. Is that Was that part of the... Yeah, how does that fit into your whole trajectory? Because that's interesting. Well, so like I said, I never thought they'd pick me to be an astronaut. So yep. 
um, I wanted to make my career um, everything that I wanted it to be. And just a job that I really enjoyed where I'm actually working as an aerospace engineer, applying the um, things that I learned in graduate school and being successful. So, you know, one of the reasons I ended up leaving graduate school and going to Ford Motor Company first was because, you know, one of the big things I wanted to show my advisor is that he taught me really well and everything he taught me I can take to any company and perform well and be su successful. And so when the CIA came up, it was another opportunity to do that. And, you know, I didn't know what they wanted an aerospace engineer to do. I knew about like some uh, analysis of, you know, different aircraft and anything that flies and things like that. So it was an opportunity to like kind of expand my horizon and continue to grow as an aerospace engineer. Wow. All right. How long did you work for the CIA? So I was there for almost seven and a half years, and you know I was a fighter aircraft analyst, and you know just um, looking at. So I was in the nonproliferation arms control group for a, a little bit, and then I went on to become a technical operations officer, and you know really that you know working there was really the first time that I felt like I knew the difference between being very very technical and being operational, and how those two combined to to make an astronaut, because I think a lot of what astronauts do is um, you're this very technical person working in an operational environment. So. Interesting. So, yeah, I'm just curious about that, that answer, the difference between technical and operational, especially because you're, you're in the ISS operations branch now? Well, Sorry. so I'm, I'm kind of in that branch, but I'm really working, I'm really training mostly now. So what I mean by that is that, you know, you can be a scientist or an engineer who can design a beautiful aircraft, but you can't necessarily fly it, right? Oh. Or you can be a fighter pilot who can't necessarily design an airplane, but you can fly it. So at some point um, along the way, um, a lot of fighter pilots are becoming much, much more techy, and a lot of scientists are becoming more and more operational. And so it's that combination that I, I believe, you know, we kind of learn at NASA, being in the astronaut corps, all of those things come together where you are, you have to know a lot of deep technical things. You're not super deep, but you're also not super shallow on these topics either. And then we have to work in these operational environments and perform at a high level. Uh, so what was the selection process like? This, this process that you had told yourself would never work in your favor, what did that end up being like? Well, so I'm probably a bad example because <laughs> when I went in, I really, um, you know, the, it was, there were a lot of interviews, you're working with a lot of people. Um, uh, it, it, we had to do this exercise event with some of the current astronauts at the time. And so it really is like a blur because you're so nervous, you don't know what to expect. Um, and you have to do these interviews with a psychologist at one point. And I was so sure that I wouldn't get selected. Um, I can't even remember the question that they asked and I said, well, you know, I have no choice but to go with my awkward self, so that's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> and not thinking that I would ever get selected, I was like, I'm just going to be myself. And, you know, people say that may have worked for you, but, you know, I, there really is no recipe for getting selected. I know people think that, well, you have to do this, you have to put this on your resume, you have to do that, you have to do this. There are requirements that are written down, but there's still no recipe. When you look at the groups of people that have come in, we're all so different. We've all got different strengths and different weaknesses even. And so what is the recipe to getting in? Um, there really is not one. And it does depend, like each time a group comes in to interview, it's a whole different set of people interviewing you than who interviewed me. Oh, interesting. And so it's like, how do you select um, the best rock out of a group of rocks? <laughs> and you know, if someone brings you one, it's like, oh, not that rock. But they all, okay, all of these rocks have something, there's something great about all of them. I mean, there were people that I interviewed with um, who I just think, I just thought were phenomenal. I was like, I'm sure they'll get in. And they didn't get in. I'm like, well, what, wait a minute, what happened? How did I get in and this person didn't get in? And so, you know, there's, there's no true recipe for getting in. And I wish there were where people can go and they can do, make their resume exactly this and boom, you hand it in and you're in. 
but that's not how it works, unfortunately. And I don't know if you've ever been involved with judging like a group of great people. How do you pick the greatest out of a group of great people? Yep. It's very difficult, right? <laughs> so um, the interview process is, um, it's a regular interview. Basically, you're one of the things that's not regular, I remember sitting at the head of a table and then you have a whole bunch of astronauts and other people sitting around the table asking you questions and just interviewing you. It's very, very daunting, okay? And so, you know, that's one part of it, but even that is not like the thing that gets you selected. So I would say what I always tell students is make sure you have a career that you love and that you're working hard in that career because you love it. And the only thing that could take you away from that career is getting selected for the astronaut corps. But also, be prepared for an opportunity when it comes up. If you're not ready for the opportunity when it comes up, then you, do you really want to be in the Corps? Do you really not? I mean, if you, it's not that you have to work and, and put things on your resume to like um, just things that you think people want to see. So if it's not a career that you really love and you're not ready for the opportunity, it's kind of like it usually doesn't work out for that type of person. But if you have a career that you love, you're working hard in it, it's a technical field, you're um, active and you're out doing outdoors things, like you could be hiking, biking, flying, scuba diving, all these different things, and really staying fit, um, you know, those are the things that you have to do and be, to be ready for an opportunity when they come along. So this is, this is purely uh, observational, but when I listen to astronauts talk or even do the, the short little videos from the International Space Station where they show how you eat a tortilla or sleep or whatever, um, I'm struck always by a sense of humor and also by this just kind of unflappable sort of attitude, at least to the outside observer where nothing, it seems, would really freak you out, and you can just take everything with a grain of salt, probably laugh at it. Is that, is that just my um, sort of idealizing of an astronaut, or do you think mm -hmm. that that's a, por uh, a part of it that's pretty important? Well, I, I do think that's important, and I don't think it's, um, I think it's normal, because we, we really do train a lot. And um, even flying in the backseat of the T-38 jet, we have things that go wrong. Um, you know, one time we lost one of um, the air data computers that we were on board, and then we just had to switch to another one, or we had a circuit breaker that popped. I mean, it could be a number of things that happen. Where, you know, the, the, the big thing is understanding that something has gone wrong, um, think about how to fix it, and then move forward from there. And, you know, training that is, um, is, is kind of done in everything that we do, like even scuba diving, spacewalk um, training, um, flying the T-38s. You know, you're gonna have emergencies. How do you respond? Um, we train a lot of emergencies for the International Space Station as well, like if there's a fire, if there's a rapid depressurization, um, if we have an ammonia leak into the compartment. So there's several things that we do in order to train to kind of um, understand that stuff is gonna happen and how you respond is everything. Um, because you can make it worse or you can solve the problem. Sometimes you can't solve the problem, you just need to know that you did your best, okay, we gotta move forward. Okay, so you mentioned that you are training on um, Boeing uh, aircraft, SpaceX, and one other one? On um, the Russian Soyuz. The Soyuz, training. of course. Yeah, so, so does that mean you're preparing for an ISS trip? Have you already been there? Like, what are you, what are you training to do exactly? Well, I've trained for several things. So I've done, um, so in 2017, I was the backup for the um, Expedition 56, 57 at the time. And so I've trained completely for the Soyuz. The Russians certified me as their backup, like if anything had happened, I would have gone to space then. I've also trained for the um, SpaceX as the backup for Anna Kikina, who's now in space right now. So I've done all the SpaceX training. We were doing, prior to that, I was doing training for the Boeing vehicle. Um, and that has not um, launched yet, but it will launch soon. So it is interesting um, training for all these vehicles because there's different interfaces for all of them. And so there's different nuances. They all do the same thing, but in a different way. Interesting. Is there one you find 
uh, more intuitive or easier? Well, the SpaceX Dragon is definitely easier. Um, I really do like the um, Soyuz too. It is a little different. Um, everything's in Russian though, so that's the one thing that you have to take yep. away there is that you have to read the procedures in Russian. All the panels are in Russian, and uh, you know there's a lot of training that goes along with that as well. Um, but I, I definitely think that right now, um, in looking at how uh, the Dragon operates. Um, it is a little bit more, um, it's designed for commercial use. Mm -hmm. So you could have any kind of crew, you can have the Axiom crew on there, you have Inspiration4 on there as well. So you don't necessarily have someone who's trained as like a NASA astronaut. We have the advantage of testing ourselves in T-38s, um, different training environments and things like that. So we do respond differently than um, you know, a crew that has not had the years of training that we have at NASA. There's, there's definitely a little bit of a, an advantage that we have in doing that. How much time would you say you've spent on the ISS? So I have not spent <laughs> okay. time on the ISS. So hopefully, um, so hopefully um, in a year or so, okay. I will spend uh, five to six months on the space station. So I've done a lot of training, and I need a lot of training. Yes. <laughs> I've got 440 hours wow. in the doing spacewalk training. Okay. I'm not sure I'll do a spacewalk, though. Um, I've got a lot of robotics time. I've got a lot of T-38 time. I've done all the systems in Russia several times. Um, I've done almost all the training for SpaceX. Only reason why I didn't do the last part was because it became a clear and official that Anna would fly. Mm. And so um, all the training is done. I'm just kind of redoing some things, so we'll see how that goes. I mean, and there's um, ups and downs and things that go on um, at NASA and everywhere, but, um, you know, the training is there, and we're getting ready, um, hopefully, in a year or so to launch. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So patience, another important attribute of an astronaut. Oh, <laughs> yes, definitely patience. Um, and patience and understanding is the, is the best way to put it. Yeah. And patience because, you know, at one point we did not have the dragon flying. And so the cadence to go to space was a lot longer, um, meaning there weren't that many launches per year. And all of the launches were from um, Baikonur in Kazakhstan. And so up until um, Doug and, uh, and uh, Bob launched, we only had one way to the International Space Station, right. and that was through the Russians. Yep. Yep. Right. Um, so I read that you enjoy scuba diving, and you've mentioned it a couple times. Mm. Um, I do as well. I think it's probably the closest I will ever get to being on an alien planet. But I'm curious if you see scuba diving as good training for being in space or for a kind of mindset or, or what your uh, connection to that as an activity is. So for me, the reason I loved it, is, and I still do love it a lot, I have, just haven't been in about a year now, so it's kind of like a, um, becoming elusive, and i got to get back to it. Um, it is one of the environments, it's kind of like flying in the T-38 jet. Um, it is actually a high threat environment that you're working in. You can really hurt yourself scuba diving. And if you don't understand what's happening at the time, um, you can actually kill yourself, if that makes sense. So it's a really high threat environment to operate and work in. So to me, understanding that and operating well and making it um, kind of normal, like you're just operating um, in a safe manner automatically. It's almost muscle memory. And um, that's one of the reasons I think it is useful for space. We also use scuba diving as a way um, entry into space, um, excuse me, spacewalk training. So we have a huge pool in Houston. It's called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. And we practice spacewalks in neutral buoyancy underwater. And so the pool is 40 feet deep. It's 100 feet wide and 200 feet long. And we have a mock-up of the main truss of the International Space Station where we would do majority of the repairs, um, removal of equipment and repairing of equipment, and even adding different things on, like new batteries, for example. And so underwater, we can get to the point where we're almost like um, gravity's not impacting us, and we could sort of move through the water that way. And you know, that's one way we learn how to, we actually learn um, kind of like the, the lay of the land of the space station. 
And so as a scuba diver, you're like, okay, well, where am I going? Is this um, starboard? Is this port? Am I going aft or forward? And so you kind of learn the lingo for doing a spacewalk. And you can learn the lay of the land because you don't want someone to say, hey, you're going to head up the Cedar Spur and go um, starboard towards the um, batteries. And you're like, well, where the heck is that? <laughs> and so <laughs> scuba diving, you kind of get a lay of the land and you know where you're going. But one of the reasons I like to tell students about scuba diving is because of that threat factor, mm. that you have to learn it and you have to be able to operate safely doing that activity. Um, you don't necessarily have that with hiking or you know running or any other exercise that you do, but for scuba diving, you really have to pay attention. That's parachuting true. is another one. I'm not a big fan of parachuting, even though I've done two tandem jumps, but um, I think scuba diving is a lot um, less expensive than parachuting. So I think telling students that you can learn how to scuba dive and learn how to operate in a high threat environment and be successful and go there, perform, and come back safely. Nice. I love that. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to circle back to a comment you made earlier about liking the expanse, because yeah, folks were folks were applauding. Uh huh. Yeah, I think I think there's some other expanse fans here. Um, so I'm curious about what, uh, it's an amazing series, but what, what really speaks to you? Are, are there things about what happens or certain characters or just the idea of mining asteroids? What, what's, what grabs you about the expanse? <laughs> well, one thing is um, there was a short story that I read um, in Isaac Asimov's little uh, short story book called The Martian, and it was about mining ice in the asteroid belt. Yeah. And so that was one thing that caught my eye, but also just the way that they tried to incorporate real science. Like there was one scene where a person who lived on the moon all their life was brought to Earth and he was being tortured by just being exposed to gravity. <laughs> and so that whole notion of what happens to your body living in zero G or micro G, one six gravity, um, incorporating that and letting people really understand, wow, well, yeah, if someone was born on another planet with uh, less than uh, 1G, you know, how would their bones grow? Right. Um, what would their bodies look like? Um, what would their eyes look like? Because you have this fluid shift in space too when you don't have gravity pulling it down. Mm -hmm. So what would this person look like and what countermeasures would they use? And that's the other thing. They were using these countermeasures for radiation um, poisoning. And so these are ideas that we'll likely need in the future if we're going to explore further and further out in space. Do you think asteroid mining is, uh, is in our future? Uh, I always say, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of times where life has imitated um, science fiction. And so, you know, it's just the weirdest thing to see how we can get these ideas by watching a show like Star Trek, like The Expanse, and then come up with real world things that we could actually do. So, you know, with that said, I think um, who knows what will happen. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I do have some questions about uh, things that are, well, advances or um, projects happening in space, uh, such as, you know, returning to the moon, the Project Artemis. Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts about, about that other than, I mean, excitement pot potentially, but. Well, it is it's extremely <laughs> exciting. Um, so the Artemis program is, um, I, so I, it's just gonna be a huge monumental advance in our space exploration capabilities as well. But to now try to establish a permanent presence somewhere on the moon and try to eventually get to the point where we are there all the time. I mean, it'll take some time to do that, but um, that's okay. We'll eventually get there. So the Artemis program, going back to the moon, um, will open up a lot of things. Um, for example, we were discussing whether or not um, the ISS will be retired. Um, I think what will happen is, you know, there'll be commercial elements that are commercial entities that will take over the International Space Station and that'll free up NASA so that we can focus on the moon. You know, how do we excavate, and I shouldn't say excavate, how do we glean resources in situ on the moon? That's going to take a, a new way of thinking and new technologies to do that. And then how do we use those resources for fuel, for producing, um, you know, potentially just having an oxygen generation point, you know, what do we, 
Now, how do we use some of these things that are on the planet and developing the technologies to do that? Uh, there's going to be so many different technologies that um, pop up just because we are trying to establish a permanent presence there. When you think about how do you really live here on Earth, how do you translate that to the moon where we only have one sixth gravity and we have to have an enclosed environment? We've got to produce oxygen. Um, we, there's a number of things that we have to think about and how to do that. And that, how do we develop a cadence where we're launching to the moon and coming back? You know, this cadence, we have to have the propulsion systems, we have, we have to have a, a, quite a few things, and even developing the gateway system and the human landing system. Um, there's a lot of things that have to be considered. And, you know, some of the things um, that we'll see pop up in the future, um, I think initially we're going to see missions that are going to go out and go around the moon and come back, mm -hmm. kind of like the Apollo program. And then we'll eventually see people landing on the moon and coming back. And then, you know, we're going to develop a gateway. Then we'll see people launching and going to the gateway, then landing on Earth, uh, landing on the moon, going back to the gateway, coming back to Earth. And so the big thing that I think is going to come out of this also is how do we get the human body to last longer outside of the Earth's protection? Right. Um, so that's the big thing. You know, if we can only have people that can go to the moon for 30 days at most right now, um, how do we extend that? How do we get it so that people can actually live on the moon? What kind of radiation protection will we be able to provide for them? So those are the technologies, I think, um, and getting people to start thinking about that is kind of um, the cool thing that Artemis has done, is that going to the space station and you kind of develop this cadence and you develop a mindset. But when you start thinking about how we're going to go out further, that's the excitement um, that I have around Artemis is that I think um, a ton of new technologies are going to pop up that we never even thought about. And potentially, I mean, Mars would have the same issue regarding radiation protection and some of these same challenges. So the idea being, if you can, you know, have some solutions, try them out on the moon, potentially. A huge engineering test bed, that's right. Uh -huh. And so even though we do want to pr develop a permanent um, presence on the moon, but it still will be an engineering test bed because uh, how horrible would it be to get out to Mars, land there, and it's like, oh, we didn't think about that. Right. And come, you can't come back home um, quickly, right? And so if you could test it all out on the moon as you would, I mean, it's one-sixth versus one-third gravity. Um, if you can test it all out before you go, that's the best, safest way to do it. And so, you know, that's, uh, I think, the challenge here. How do we take everything we do there and translate it to the Mars? Right. Yeah. So, um, have you seen For All Mankind? <laughs> I've seen major parts of it. It is uh -huh. hard to watch. <laughs> yep. I, it's great, though. It's, it's one of my favorite shows. Folks out here watch For All Mankind. Yep, okay. So, I'm thinking about it for a couple reasons. One, because they uh, multiple countries establish a presence on the moon. And it becomes a little uh, contentious, you know. Are we going to play nice with the with the Russian camp, and are we going to share the ice we found, et cetera? Um, do you do you think that's going to become a a question, the the resource question, just in space rather than on Earth? Well, one of the um, things that ha has been happening is these um, Artemis Accords. Yep. And so we're we're trying to head that off, I think. And so that things don't become contentious and that we can work, you know, go back to the moon, not just as the United States, but, you know, it's the world going back to the moon for all mankind <laughs> um, and not for just, you know, for only our benefit. And uh, everything we learn should be for the world. Um, how that's done is still, um, I think it's still being worked out and it's way above my pay grade on how they're doing that. <laughs> and so like there are governments and different things that are involved in, in that whole process. But I do know that like, you know, I visited Bogota, Colombia mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago and there's huge interest in not just, um, well, scientists there, um, many, many people in Bogota. I was, I was pleasantly surprised with the, I mean, literally thousands of people um, that I had a chance to talk to you and how much interest there is in going back to the moon and being a big, um, being a player in that, just having some part of it. So there's many countries, I think, 
who want to want to like just be a part of something that is that huge. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'll I'll see what the uh, what the audience wants to ask you. Um, but my question is if. If you had the power to green light any kind of mission, whether crude or, or not, where would you send it and why? Wow, that's a, that's a, so, you know, that's a great, so I have multiple places I would love to go. Um, whether or not it's doable, I don't know. Um, uh, so I would love to go to like uh, one of the moons, um, Io. Mm -hmm. Um, Titan, and just, you know, maybe just kind of like get into orbit and stay there and do some studies. But back here on Earth, you know, I've had some great experience with these analog missions. Like living underwater, there's still so much underwater that right. is, is we don't know about. And, you know, it's, there's, there are reasons we haven't done it and can't do it. But, you know, developing the technology so that we can is, yeah, it's still out there. I'm like going down the Marianas Trench and figuring out all these other things that's happening underwater. So investigating underwater is a, another big thing that I think would be very cool. Yeah. But it, it is, um, gosh, it, it's so tough to kind of think of where I would want to go specifically. Just those are big ideas right there. But, oh gosh, I mean, of course Mars, but what if we can go do sort of the ice mining in the belt? You know, that's, those are just big ideas that, and dreams, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know, I, you know, I can't answer that like definitively. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. All right, do we have uh, questions from our online or in-person folks? All right, so yeah, I can take your question, sir, right in the front, yeah. Thank you. So I'm of the mindset that if we can get me there, we can get me back. And so <laughs> I think the technology is there. We just have to figure out how to do it. And so, you know, the, the idea of a one-way mission should, it should never cross anyone's mind. I think there should always be a way to get people there. And if you, I mean, it's, it's totally um, one-third gravity. I mean, it's not going to be as a Herculean effort as it is to get off the earth. Mm -hmm. um, if they can get me there, they can get me back home. <laughs> okay. Maybe not in a day, but still, they can get me back. <laughs> Sounds like you're going. I don't know. <laughs> there was another hand. Yep, sir, in the second row. Yeah. Okay. Um, today, if I want to spend a week in Hawaii, all I need is my magic master card. <laughs> I actually think that it is possible. Um, I think with Virgin Galactic, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Sierra Nevada, all of these different companies coming up, I think it's going to be faster than we think. Um, the commercial crew program um, was an enabler of that, where like we saw Inspiration4 go. Um, that was expensive, but I do think that um, Jeff Bezos, with all the missions that he's done just to, like, you know, the 62 miles. <laughs> um, I think that everyone is, I think we're moving in that direction. The big thing that I, I want to, um, I hope people start understanding and reading more on, like what actually happens to your body when you go in space. And that's the big thing for people to understand. If you're gonna pay the money, you should understand what's gonna happen to your body, how you may respond, how you may not respond. But um, to make it a more of a, an enjoyable um, exercise, and going to space. And so, you know, you, you just don't know how your body's gonna respond. 
but experiencing that, it, there's nothing like it. I mean, uh, listening to William Shatner mm -hmm. after he went and came back, and just the sheer amount of emotion that he had in doing that and seeing the Earth from that vantage point, just amazing. And that was a short flight, so he probably didn't have any impacts or any effects, but um, that's how it starts, though. Hey, so yeah, there's, yep. <laughs> Following up on that, what uh, potential impact or problems uh, most concern you as far as your own uh, ability to meet the challenges, challenges? So as more and more people go into space, um, they're, you know, I just, um, I think I'm not really concerned because I think that um, the companies are doing a great job with training the folks who are going to go to space, Axiom folks, um, 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 the Inspiration4 folks, all of them are trained well. So I don't really have any concerns. I do think that, um, you know, the training may have to um, include more and more of like expeditionary behavior training. You know, how do we get along in space? How, you know, um, just different things like that. But I think that that will come along as we start um, having a higher and higher cadence of people going on different teams who, you know, like I'm living underwater with my crew. I'm going into the caves with the crew there. Um, you know, I always tell students, like, living underwater with five other people um, is it wasn't hard for us. We actually had a great time. But if you, if we weren't those types of people who can get along easily, um, very technical people living and working together underwater. Um, can you imagine if we didn't get along, how hard that would be? If you're not adaptable, um, flexible, and just dealing with people and dealing with different things that may go, go on, I mean, what if you get sick? You know, what if someone gets sick and you have to take care of them? Is that going to be a problem? You know, so I think as more and more people go into space, I think mostly the expeditionary behavior, the psychological aspects are going to have to be considered because I think most people are very, um, they can become very technically, um, technical, um, technically savvy and understand the systems, understand what not to do, what to do, and the training will kind of go along with that as well. Yeah. yeah. Do we have an online question? No, but we do have, uh, we, we need you guys to sort of do a quick summary of the questions because this mic is apparently not working. Oh, okay. okay. Got it. All right. So we've got a, a woman with awesome purple hair, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. We often think of doing things like going into uh, space as being um, a young person's game, right? Professional athletes who are young. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how space in reality really isn't that, but that it's, it seems to be like lots of different generations. And I just think it would be interesting to, to hear you talk about that and that it's, it's not always young people. No, in fact, okay. um, I'm assigned with a, you know, there are people who are in their 60s who are going and they are incredibly fit. Um, I don't know what their telomeres say their age is, but they are incredibly fit and um, mentally stable and capable, beyond capable. But it's their experience that um, is very important. So, you know, I would hate to take a 20-something who doesn't have a whole lot of experience in life and just throw them into this. I think developing the experience of having to um, work in austere environments, um, work with very different people, and perform at a high level is needed so that you kind of know what you're getting into. So I, I, you know, there's, I mean, there could be young people who know how to do that already. Um, and that's, that's awesome. But I do think that in the future, you'll see a whole swath of ages going. And usually people are slightly older because of the experience and background. I mean, it takes time to get to know yourself like with scuba diving, like with all these different things, how do you operate safely in a high threat environment? Um, it could be a war zone that you've worked in even. Um, different places that kind of teach you who you are and uh, so that you understand yourself that, you know, in these tough environments where you're kind of sequestered with five, five other people who aren't necessarily your friend, aren't necessarily um, somebody who you would normally be friends with, but because you, are on a crew, you're one of the crew members, 
you can operate together under one mission and become friends because of that. And so having a common mission together does bond a group of people together. But as a young person, you know, sometimes, you know, they're learning and they need, may need more experience. And, but there could be kids that age in their 20s who already know. And I don't think they're excluded at all. So. All okay, right. uh, the last shuttle mission was almost 12 years ago. How are we getting large payloads into orbit? Now the Dragon is an itty bitty uh, rocket and it couldn't handle as much cargo as a shuttle could. Yeah, so right now we have the Dragon and Cygnus and even the Russian Progress. And so, you know, I think our cadence of launching the Cygnus and the Dragon vehicles per year is enough for us right now. Um, even though we have seven people at a time living for months on the space station. So what we do is we ha if we have seven people, a lot of the like clothing that they need, even workout clothing, um, different things like that are up mass before they even arrive. And so things are, you know, having a logistics module where things are stowed and stored, even equipment is stored, has become even more important um, now that the shuttle has retired. So we haven't had a real issue with that lately. I do think one of the toughest jobs that we have in mission control is the stowage guy, the ISO guy. So finding things and making sure we stow things in places where we can find them again later is, it can be a task <laughs> because stuff floats away. <laughs> so. Uh, we're asking. He's asking about the uh, the launch of a new module and how that's gonna how that's gonna work. Well, so I'm not sure you're talking about the MLM. No, oh. I'm talking about a replacement module for the space shuttle. Oh, replacement for the space station. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so but do we have a need to do 30 tons? So we we do um, have a logistics module called the PMM. And, it's, and then the Japanese also have their um, um, JLP, that's what it's called, and that's their logistics um, vehicle. So we do have a lot of things stowed on the station already, so we don't need as much stuff as we did during the shuttle era, but we may have, um, you know, if, I think in the future when the ISS potentially goes to a commercial entity, we may have additional modules attached to maybe the node to forward and maybe in different locations. So um, we'll, we'll have to work that out. And you know, some of this is above my pay grade, like you know, will we have another module docking to the front of the station? Um, I think there are plans to do that, but um, the logistics for that will be worked out along with it. All right. All right, well, hey, you have the microphone. You can take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll give the back of the room some love after this one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, as this is a science fiction community, so you know because you you know you, you like some of the stuff that this community creates. Yeah. As someone who actually lives that, what do you dislike seeing from this creative body? And then conversely, what would you like to see more of that we could represent more accurately? Well, one of the big things that I absolutely love is how a lot of writers really try to get the science right and show the world of like advanced technology, not just like advanced, not um, like the science that we see currently. It's like very advanced stuff that you get to see and they really try to get it right. Um, I'll, I remember Andy Weir sitting in um, a sim that I was in and he's really sitting there trying to get the data right and how we actually operate in mission control and in different locations. So that's the thing that trying to get the science right, even though sometimes, um, you know, like back in with um, Star Trek, having a screen where you could actually see the person you're talking to was kind of like, that'll never happen. <laughs> but okay, it's cool to see. And now it's like FaceTime. I don't even want to turn the FaceTime on. You know, you wake up in the morning, someone wants to FaceTime you, it's like, no. And so, but you know, so that's, those are the kind of things I like, like trying to get the science right, but also pushing the science too. So like having an on-screen video of the person you're talking to on our phones, 
we would have, I don't know if anyone would have ever thought of that if we hadn't seen Star Trek, right? So pushing the technology and um, pushing the science is another big thing, trying to get it right and then pushing it forward even more. Um, the things, I mean, there's not much I don't like. I mean, I love science fiction. It's just, it just causes you, your imagination to go, you know, full speed. So there's not much I don't like. I mean, there may be some stories like I don't really like. I guess when the science is grossly, grossly um, mistaken, I think that's, that's what I'll call it. Um, but in general, I think most science fiction, like um, The Expanse, they got so much right. <laughs> and then pushing the technology on top of that, I still want a Roxanante myself. I want one of those vehicles. Um, so, you know, there really isn't much I don't like about science fiction, to be honest. So, and especially this community where it's so inclusive, um, everything is, um, everyone's included. I mean, that's what Star Trek was about. So the science fiction community is one of my absolute. I loved, um, I love Worldcon. I love any um, venue that I get to go to because we get to have conversations like this. And this is very cool, so. First, first of all, thank you for coming in this very interesting. Um, my question is, you were talking about living on the moon and you could stay for 30 days or so, um, and then going to Mars. How different is Mars on the human body or what other things are different about Mars that you had to adjust to? And could Matt Damon really have survived that many years? <laughs> so. I actually think some of the t a lot of the things that Andy Weir talked about, I think, are doable. Um, Mars is only different. It has one third gravity. It actually has an atmosphere. Um, it has weather. Um, so figuring out how to get the human body to last longer, I'm not sure how the human body will, um, how much of an impact one third gravity will have on the body versus one G. Um, so those are all things we have to figure out. And going to the moon where we have one-sixth gravity, um, so the Mars is somewhere in between. Mar um, the moon has no atmosphere, so we can't fly a helicopter there. But on Mars, you know, maybe we can use small helicopters to transport things, to help us build things. Um, so you know, having a, a, a vehicle that can actually fly on Mars is, is kind of cool. We can't do that necessarily. Huh? Say again, I'm sorry. Could he also have come back to Earth and lived after all that time? So that's a, another thing. Um, even now when we go to space for six months or something like that, um, a year maybe we come back, there is an adaptation period that we have to go through, um, partly because our inner ear, like in low Earth orbit, basically micro G, our inner ear doesn't know up from down because there's no gravity. And so when we come back, our ears have to readjust to this gravity. So you get this, probably this sort of spinning effect trying to figure out which way is up and down. So you may feel nauseous when you return. And you know, there's probably about a, up to a two week adaptation period where you get used to being back in gravity. One thing that we do in space to maintain the structural integrity of our outer bones is we exercise a lot. So when we go to Mars, well, we have to exercise a lot. Can we pop a pill <laughs> and it's okay? Can we take a shot and uh, get a shot and, and it's okay? So developing countermeasures to the impacts on the physical body is, I think, is gonna be important. Yeah. Um, what is the um, effect of the war in Ukraine with much participation in the space program and given the advances in the U.S. commercial companies, what's the future of Russian participation? So, you know, our relationship with Russia is excellent. I mean, I can't say enough about my um, cosmonaut colleagues. Um, they are phenomenal to work with. Um, I've had some really great experiences, um, you know, from training with Sergei Prokopiev um, and passing our exams together, which was um, amazing. And then even just being invited to Yuri Gagarin's Banya because I'm a part of the crew. So it is amazing working with my Russian colleagues. They are, I can't say that it's, you know, this, the government is the same as the person, 
people, working with all the people out in Star City is, is one of our closest relationships. And we want to maintain that relationship. So um, working with Anna Kikana this, these past, um, this past summer for the Crew 5 launch, she's amazing. We had so much fun working together and just getting in there and getting the job done together. Um, so our relationship with Russia with respect to space is very good. Uh, I don't I think in the future, I think it's going to continue to be that way. Um, but I, I do think that our relationship with our cosmonauts is, um, is something that's going to stay. Um, it's different. I, I want to say it's different than working with government to government. I, I, yeah. I, I don't know what else. So I was wondering how you dealt with the disappointment after you were abruptly taken off the Soyuz mission in 2018. Like I assume there's a lot of like anticipation that comes with that. So how did you manage it? Well, that was a huge disappointment. And uh, you know, I won't lie, that was a huge disappointment. And getting back to the office and trying to understand what, why, where, what, what happened um, was a process. <laughs> but the process ended with me being reassigned in August 2020. And it's just taking a while now to get Boeing off the ground. But it, I mean, it, the way, you know, stuff is gonna happen in life. And understanding us, you know, some being very technical and understanding that merit is very important for a kid. They also have to understand that politics is very, it's very important in any environment you're working in, understanding the culture, understanding the people. Um, and moving forward from that, you know, one of the biggest things is understanding my purpose and my values and where they lie within this whole thing. Um, responding properly to things rather than being so reactive, you have to be very proactive. So understanding the process and understanding the culture, huge. Responding proactively, incredibly important. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so I have two questions. Um, so I'm uh, writing science fiction stories that involve space. So I'm just curious, uh, based on your experience and background in the space program, what are some like concepts and circumstances that you would like to see in science fiction that you haven't already seen? And then my second question is, what role does religion and spirituality play in space? Wow, I'm glad you asked that because that has been a big... Um topic. So first, to answer the first part, so, you know, all of these new things that are coming out, like um, quantum entanglement, yeah, we've kind of dabbed in that and just a little bit, but really getting into like, you know, how does, what does that look like? How will that play out in a science fiction movie? I don't know, but that would be cool to see. <laughs> More of that. Um, and there's all types of um, different topics. Um, and theories that Einstein had that you know you can play in and see where that science and that technology and that concept where it could take you because that's you pushing the science, which is kind of cool. Um, when I think of theology, so I went to a Jesuit undergrad, and you know since you know when I was removed from flight, I really got uh, my um, Jesuit colleagues got in touch with me. We've been having these great conversations, but um. I think there's incredible, uh, an incredible connection <laughs> because more and more, the more that I learn and more and more I see, the more I know I don't know and I want to know. And that does kind of link you to the spirituality, spirituality because it's not just the physical body anymore. It's, there's like our eyes only see, you know, a s small percentage of this um, frequency band. So, you know, what else is out there? If we had different sensors, what else could we see? And, you know, when you start thinking of, I know that when um, I'm looking out into space and I'm out in maybe Moab, Utah, and I'm in a canyon and I look up, the sky is covered in stars. And so, I mean, it is, I mean, there's billions of galaxies. Holy cow. And so for me, I start thinking, there's got to be something else out there. There's got to be something else. And so, um, you know, it's, um, it's an interesting thought process in thinking about theology from space and thinking about um, spirit, spirituality 
in space and how that connects us closer to God, to, you know, it's different for everyone. And I do know that the more science I learn, the more things I hear, the more things I see, I know I don't know, and I want to know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that made me think of uh, your point about William Shatner, William Shatner's reaction and just the overview effect, which is something astronauts talk about experiencing when they see Earth as one small, you know, single planet, like you can see it all and it's the size of a baseball or whatever from where you are and just everything that you've ever known has been on that planet and like, wow, climate stuff. I mean, just, I, I cannot, sometimes I wonder, you know, if our warring leaders were to go into space and have a moment where they could experience the overview effect, would they still fight? You know, so I, I don't know. They I, probably I would, but it would be, <laughs> it would be kind of a moot point. It's like, Dude, we're, we're just all one. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. Hi. Hi. You mentioned that you're a twin, and they've already done a study of twins, one in space and one not. Has anybody brought that up with you? Uh, twin well, study. Well, see, the, the, the thing is that the twin study was amazing, but it's only one data set. And so we need to do hundreds of twins. And so my twin sister, we're fraternal, even though if you saw us together, you said, mm, yeah, they're definitely fraternal. But gosh, we, look, we have different blood types, so that's why I know we're, we're, we're fraternal. Um, but the thing that she has and I have, we have cells that are about the same age. And mine will be differentiated from that point in time, and hers will stay the same. So you can probably see something. Um, should we do a study? I think we should do a study if we start doing more twin studies and getting more and more twins into space, even for a short duration, um, maybe just 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, and seeing how that the cells of the one twin who is in space, I always tell my sister, <laughs> I said, I'm going to come back younger than you. <laughs> so <laughs> so exactly. I have to tease her and say, hey, I'm, I'm much younger than you now, even though I'm baby A, I always call her baby B. So, <laughs> so you know, I think if we started doing more twins, I think it would be a valid data point. But until we do more and more twin studies, um, I think the data is a good um, starting point and seeing, oh, there are some differences. Is it um, significant or, you know, is it only significant for that set of twins though? You know what I mean? So I, I, I just, I hope we do start doing more studies because um, twin studies are, um, they're rare. Um, and so how, I guess one thing that we should think about is how can we do a study sort of like that, but, um, and get the same data. Should we just use different people and just kind of collect all that data and see what's significant in that data? Um, that's what we're kind of doing now. We've got a lot of different people flying in space and we're collecting the data. So, you know, we'll see how that, um, all the data that we already have stands up to the twin study, the data that came out of that. It's hard. It's actually a really hard, um, hard um, experiment to conduct. All right, there's another hand behind you there. Yeah, there you go. Um. Does this mean that we're going to send Scott and Mark back up? I don't think they want to go back right now. <laughs> I think um, Mark is content being the senator, and Scott, is um, he's got his own platform. He's writing books and doing things like that. And he's got a lot of wisdom and experience that he can talk to. Um, whether or not he wants to go again, I don't know. But I mean, it would be interesting to see what happens. Um, but so the, the data for those two, you know, even though they have both had been to space, um, when you come back, you are, you kind of go back to normal. So there should, there should have been something significant that they found out. But um, it, yeah, it would be interesting to ask Scott if he wants to go back. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a daughter who has um, bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering. Are there any, like, um, groups that she should be joining for, for women in that particular engineering branch? Well, one thing I, I would encourage her to do is, um, I mean, she's very young, so I would have her 
try a lot of different things. Like, I mean, even, so one thing for me was um, work, you know, accepting an offer from the CIA to work there. People thought that was crazy, but I was a scientist there. I learned a lot about my country. I learned a lot about, um, uh, you know, I got really deep into different topics and, and not just aerospace. So there were many, many opportunities. And so even though you're aerospace, you're a scientist, you're an engineer. So there's more than just that one topic that you worked on. And so I would just recommend expanding my horizons on all different topics. And there are lots of groups for women, but I wouldn't limit that to, I wouldn't limit my career or just the groups that I joined to that. I would join many different groups to understand like, okay, well, what's going on? Like, for example, SAE was always like the guys group. I, would, I mean, I, I worked at Ford Motor Company. I would totally <laughs> join some of those organizations and just find out what they're doing. And, you know, seeing if it's, it's something that I'm interested in. So in order to find your passion and your purpose, you know, trying many different things and getting involved, really, just being involved and making sure you're being a, a contributing member to a lot of these things is, is extremely important. And, you know, I, I, do, I do think that there is um, a reason to focus on women, but I tell women not to focus on just being a, a, the woman in the group, be the crew member on the group, the go-to crew member where people are asking you, hey, how do I do this? So being that go-to person, crew member, just crew member, not the female in the group. Um, you know, I don't wanna be known as the black girl on the group, in the group. I'm one of the crew members is what I tell people. So um, I tell them to focus on that because stuff is gonna happen. Like um, young lady asking me about being removed from flight. Stuff is always gonna happen. Um, how you respond is everything, so. All right, looks like we have one uh, hand back there. Yeah. Prejudices and stuff against you. I probably don't. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there probably was, but my f and I always tell people that I'm sure that people had problems with me, but it was their problem. <laughs> it wasn't my problem, <laughs> and so I don't take on other people's um, stuff. I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, I'm sure there were, and you know, even there were times where things were, you know, they can be in your face even but still it's their problem and I, I can't solve it for them. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, any others? All right. Can I say one thing? Of course, yes. Well, thank Please. you guys for the questions. This is one of the reasons I love coming to um, any science fiction conferences because we always have these great conversations. And thank you, Joelle. Well, thank you um, for very coming. Much. So folks, there are signed photos of Jeanette up at the, the round table here with the brown um, tablecloth. If anybody would like one as a memento, 